This is our final sermon in our study of the book of Ephesians. So this morning we come to Ephesians 6, verses 21 through 24. Ephesians 6, 21 through 24. Listen now as I read, for this is the very word of God. So that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. May the Lord bless to our hearts and minds the reading of his word. You may be seated. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we ask that by the power of your Spirit working through your Word, you would give us greater understanding of the Gospel, you would strengthen our faith in the Gospel, and at a very practical level, you would have the Gospel change and transform the way we live and interact with one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm sure you know the drill. You've probably done it countless times. You watch a movie, you come to the end, and the credits start to roll. Now, technically, the end credits are part of the movie, but most of us, it's probably fair to say, once the credits start to roll, we begin to check out and move on. Most of us, we just get up and leave the theater or we turn the TV off at that point. Some of us may stay there in silence to the bitter end. I don't know, maybe we feel like we really want to get our money's worth. Or maybe we want to honor those involved in the creation of the film. Or maybe we just have an odd desire to know who the best boy grip is. But in any case, most of us, we don't pay too much attention to the closing credits. And that's okay, because the main story is over. It's okay to move on. You really aren't missing anything. Now, I mentioned that this morning because when we come to the end of New Testament epistles, I think many of us have a similar response. We say, eh, the main body of the work is complete. There's generally some names that we don't know. There's some general pleasantries expressed that go something like greetings and grace and peace and something else and yada, yada, yada. So many of us, we just kind of skim through or skip altogether the final verses of New Testament letters. We think to ourselves, I, I think it's okay to move on, right? We're really not missing anything. But I tell you, if, if we were to do this, it would be a mistake. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is inspired by God and therefore profitable for training in righteousness. And I believe that includes the end of New Testament letters. The lists of names, the final greetings, the pleasantries. And, and even though the ends of New Testament letters do tend to conform to a general pattern, they all have something particular to say, something to call us to, something to remind us of. And if we will continue to stay dialed in until the very end, we will see there is always something to be gained with the, the final credits, if you will. So with these thoughts in mind, we turn our attention to the final verses of Ephesians. And as we examine Paul's final greetings and well wishes for the church, I'd like us to notice three things, three things that are found here in these verses, but as we will see, three things that connect us back to the message of the whole letter. Number one, these verses give us a clear snapshot of Paul's yearning for and his commitment to real biblical fellowship. Number two, these verses remind us of the, the nature and the character of the fellowship that Paul yearned for. 
And finally, these verses give us a clear understanding of the ultimate source of such fellowship. So, so again, this is where we're going. The, the yearning for the commitment to fellowship, an understanding of the nature of the fellowship that one is yearning for, and the source of that fellowship. Let's consider each in turn. Paul's yearning for and his commitment to biblical fellowship can be seen in his efforts to let the Ephesians know how he is doing. Paul writes, so that you may know how I am and what I am doing, and then he goes on to say, he's sending Tychicus, who is the beloved brother and fellow minister in the Lord, and Tychicus, Paul says, will tell you everything. And then, just in case they miss the point, Paul reiterates that he has sent Tychicus to them for this very purpose, that you may know how we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. It's obviously very important to Paul that the Ephesians know how he is and what he is doing. He repeats this as a point of emphasis, but we ask, why? Why does it matter? Why does Paul care? I mean, he's already given them this great theology of salvation. He's given them this rich theology of the church. He's given them solid ethical instruction and how they are to live. Why this need for personal updates? Why the need to let them know how he is and what he is doing? And why even the need to repeat this for emphasis? I think it's because Paul really believes and seeks to live out the theology that he's been preaching. You see, what Paul has been proclaiming throughout the letter of Ephesians is that God has been doing this great work of salvation in the lives of the people of God. He has predestined before the foundation of the world. He has has chosen and predestined people to be his own. And this great mystery of the gospel has been unfolding throughout history where God now in Christ is saving a people for himself from every tongue and tribe and nation, a people made up of Jews and Gentiles of all stripes, and he's making them all into one people. This is all through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God has been making one unified people, one living temple, one dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul's been arguing throughout the letter. And and now, here in these final verses, I think Paul is demonstrating in a very practical way that he wants to live out the glorious theology that he's been teaching. How so? How is this simple desire to let people know how he's doing connected to this deep theological commitment? Well, I think in this way, if, if we really are one in Christ, if we really are one people, one dwelling place for the Spirit, then, then it seems logical for Paul to say, well, then I want you to know me. I want you to really know how I am. I want you to know how I'm doing. Even though we're separated, I want to tell you everything that's going on with me. And in doing this, I want to encourage your hearts. You see, this is no insignificant desire on Paul's point. Paul, in essence, to put it crassly, is putting his money where his mouth is. I mean, after all, what good is it to claim that we are theologically one in Christ? theologically one people, theologically one body, one temple for the one Holy Spirit, what good is it to claim such things if we don't actually want anything to do with the real people we are one with? What good is it to say, God is the God of all nations, praise the Lord, but I don't really want to have to deal with people from other cultures. What good is it to say, oh, we are one in the Spirit, but you know, leave me alone and don't bother me. What good is it? Well, it's no good. And we see here, Paul wants nothing of the sort. Paul doesn't just want to talk about the theology of the church. No, at a very practical level, he wants to be the church that he has been talking about. He wants to be the real church with real people sending real messengers in order to give real updates on how he's doing so that he might bring real encouragement to the hearts of real brothers and sisters. 
And Paul's desire here, this is not just a one-off moment in his letters. This is the norm for how Paul interacts with the churches to whom he writes. In Romans 15 and 16, we see that Paul goes to great lengths to let the church know about his travel plans, his hopes to see them in Rome on his way to Spain, and he gives extensive greetings to and from various brothers and sisters. We see in 1 and 2 Corinthians how Paul is engaged in deep and often painful personal relationships with the Corinthian church. There in the Corinthian letters, we see the messy details of real relationships with real people in real churches. The same can be said about Galatians. Or in Philippians, Paul rejoices over his partnership, his fellowship in Greek, his koinonia in the gospel with the Philippian church. And he goes on to spell out in the letter how that fellowship gets spelled out in praying particular prayers for one another. How they send brothers back and forth to each other in order to minister to one another. And how they give and receive real monetary gifts. In the Colossian, in his letter to the Colossians, even though Paul has never met this church personally, he says that he prays for them all the time. And that at the end of the letter he writes that, get this, he is sending them Tychicus, who will tell you about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. And I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Does it sound familiar? To the Thessalonians, Paul writes this. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 8, 9, reflecting on his past dealings with them, he says, So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. And of course, if we think about the letters to Timothy and Titus and Philemon, these are all personal letters written to beloved brothers. To Timothy and Titus, he even says, you are my true child in the faith. You see, in every letter Paul writes, there are a number of indications of his yearning for, his pursuit of, and experience of real connection. There's real labor to know and to be known. There's real yearning for real fellowship. See, Paul was no ivory tower theologian. He was not someone who liked to preach big on the conference circuit, but didn't want to have to deal with the little people. No, he was a man that he he knew that, that Jesus loved the church as his own bride. And Jesus gave himself up for his bride. And Paul knew that the church Jesus died for, it was not some kind of abstract theological idea, but rather it was a real living body made up of real living people. You see, Christ died for real people in order to make real people from real nations into one living body. Paul knew this. He preached it. And then with every opportunity he had, he gave himself to real relationships, the experience of them, the pursuit of them, real fellowship, real communion with real brothers and sisters for the glory of God. Let me ask you this morning, what what about us? Do we just love the theology of the church? The idea of one holy apostolic Catholic church as a kind of intellectual construct? Or do we love the real people for whom Christ died? Are we willing to work, to share, to receive like Paul did? Are we willing to say, I want you to know about me. I want you to know how I am. I want you to know what I'm doing. And I want to know you, how you're doing, what you're doing. Because I want to build actual fellowship with actual people in the church. I like that idea. But of course, the reality is a lot harder than it seems, is it not? I think especially as a regional church in Atlanta, you know, we're all spread out. We're all busy. Oh, the traffic, the schedules. And sometimes I know I feel like I just don't have room 
I don't have time for other people. I don't have time to tell you how I am, and I'm too busy to find out how you really are. And where does that leave us? It leaves us coming up short in a very practical way of the theology of church that Paul is espousing in this letter. (laughs) And I think at a practical level, these closing verses, they call us to redouble our efforts to make real connection with one another. Not to be content to just sit in the same building and listen to sermons about Ephesians, but increasingly to reach out to one another, just like Paul does in Ephesians. But then we have to ask, right? If if we're going to reach out to establish and build and strengthen relationships, what, what exactly are we seeking to establish, right? What are we hoping to experience? What what should the character of such relationships be? We want real relationships, but what does that mean, right? What kind of relationships are we aspiring to? Well, that brings us to our second consideration of the morning, which is the nature of the fellowship that Paul desired. You see, Paul wanted, he pursued real relationships with real people, but he knew he, 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 that what he needed, he yearned for a particular character to be present at the heart of those relationships. And he tells, what that, tells us what that is here in these verses. He writes, peace be to the brothers and love in, with faith. Now, you need to know, these are not just simple pleasantries on Paul's part. This is not some kind of just formal, rote greeting, you know, like, sincerely, Paul. No, in saying these things, Paul is expressing his yearning, his desires, his prayers, his his benedictions for the people of God that stand at the very heart of his theology. And this yearning starts with peace. Peace. And biblical peace, we know as we've studied Ephesians, it's It's not just the absence of conflict. It's to truly be in right relationship with one another. It is when all things are well and whole and right and good between us. And this is Paul's heart and yearning for the church. It's not just that that people would get along and, and go along. Not just that they'd be able to check a box saying, I I, I reached out to you out of duty just like I knew I was supposed to. It's not just the skill of avoiding people that get on your nerves so you can keep the peace while you're here. No, Paul desires real peace to be on all the brothers and sisters. He wants right relationship at the heart of church life between all the brothers and sisters where we're there for each other, supporting each other in truth. And we see here that this peace is marked by, it flows out of, it's connected to love with faith. I think Paul here clearly has in mind love for one another, love amongst the brothers and sisters, but also he clearly has in mind love for God. Because in the final verse, he speaks of those who love the Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. And it makes sense that peace and love would be connected in this way, right? Because you you can't have real biblical peace with someone without loving them. To be in right relationship with your neighbor, you need to love your neighbor as yourself. And to love them is is to desire their welfare, to yearn for their wholeness, even more than your own. To share, to pray, to work for the welfare of another because you're in right relationship with them, which is marked by your love for them. That's what Paul desires for the church. Nothing less. Real relationships with real people marked by real peace, and real love. How are you doing on that this morning? I know as I hear those words, that feels really daunting. And I begin to say, I I just don't know if I have that in me. (laughs) I mean, where would that come from, right? Where would I find that kind of peace and love that I could share and then establish and live in with one another? Well, I tell you, Paul's very clear. This this doesn't just come from our own self-discipline and our own commitment. 
Now, Paul is clear. If we're to have real relationships with real people marked by real peace and real love, we're going to need real help, (laughs) supernatural help. And Paul's been telling us about this help from the beginning of Ephesians, and he reminds us of it here. This peace, this love, it comes from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ as a gift of his grace. It comes from God the Father. If we go back to chapter 1, right, Paul told us there that the Father chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. See, Paul declared to us at the very outset of this letter, before the foundation of the world, God the Father loved us as his people. And in love, he ordered all of history to work out in such a way that his people would be his own. From the beginning, in love, God the Father has purposed to make us right with him, to give us peace with God. And in love, he sent his only son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to accomplish all of his saving will. And Jesus Christ lived the perfect life. He he had perfect peace with God the Father, perfect love for his heavenly Father, and perfect love for his fellow human beings. And in love, Christ died on the cross for our sins. He died for all our failures to love God and to love one another. He died for all the ways we trample on true biblical peace. He died for us. As Paul says in Ephesians 1, he redeemed us with his own blood so that in him we have the forgiveness of our trespasses. And so now through Christ we have peace. Peace with God peace with one another. We we can't manufacture it in and of ourselves. No, God gives us this peace through Christ. So that Paul can say in Ephesians 2.14, Christ himself is our peace. You see, God is love and peace. All true love and peace come from him. He first loved us. His love is manifested in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, so that now through Christ we have peace with God and peace with one another. And we ask, oh, so how do I experience that love? How do I how do I take it in? Again, Paul tells us that here. He's been telling us throughout the letter. We receive it by faith. By faith. That's Paul's yearning, right? Peace and love with faith. Paul's desire is that as as believers, we would believe all that God has done for us in the gospel. We would believe in the Father's election of us. We would believe in Christ's redemption of us through his blood. We would believe in his love, in his peace, and by believing, we would enter into that love and peace. We would experience it by faith. And the amazing thing is, as Paul has already told us in Ephesians 2, that even this faith is a gift of God. So what we see in Ephesians is that God is the source of our peace, God is the source of our love, and God is the source of our faith by which we lay hold of God's peace and love. And this love, this peace which comes from God, it then moves us to love God in return. We love God because he has first loved us. We love, we love the Lord Jesus because he has first loved us. That's what we have sung together. He loves us with a love that is incorruptible. And because the, his love for us is incorruptible, and because his love for us is actually the source of our love for him, then Paul can say here, we love Christ with a love that is incorruptible. Not because we ourselves are so strong and incorruptible, but the love that God has loved us with and with which we love God, that love is incorruptible. And all of this, Paul has been declaring to us from the beginning, is a work of God's grace. Grace. That divine, unmerited favor. You see, God loves us, and he grants us peace with him and with each other, not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it. No, far from it. God is gracious to us, even though we don't deserve it, and we can't earn it. That's the nature of grace. 
It's God's grace that led him to choose us before the foundation of the world. It's God's grace that fueled his predestin of, uh, predestination of us for adoption as sons. It's God's grace that sent Christ. It's grace that led Christ to die for us, redeeming us from all our sin. It's God's grace that sent the Spirit to indwell us. It's God's grace that has broken down the dividing wall between people groups and made us one in Christ. It's God's grace, it's God's grace that gives us good works to do that we might walk in them. It's God's grace that gives us gifts to be exercised in the church for the building up of one another. It's God's grace that enables us to walk in holiness and love one another. It's grace that establishes peace. It's grace that fills us with love. It's by grace that we have faith to believe in a gracious Savior in God. Brothers and sisters, Paul's been telling us this the entire letter, but here in the final verses, in a very truncated form, he's being gracious to us once again. He's saying, if you missed it in the first six chapters and 20 verses, don't check out now, because I'm telling you again. And the beautiful thing here is he's not just telling us. He's not just teaching us. But in these final verses, he's really praying for us, sharing his longing that we would experience the substance of what he has been teaching it's really, this is a, an appeal to believe in the gospel, to believe in the love of God, which is beyond all knowing, to believe in the gospel of peace, to believe in salvation by grace. And what Paul is saying here is, oh, by faith, I want you to experience God's peace. I want you to experience God's love. I want you to experience God's grace, and I want you to love Jesus. And in that love, I want you to yearn for one another and yearn for real relationships with real people that are marked by real interest in one another, real pursuit of peace and love and grace with one another. See, in these closing words, Paul's saying to us, I don't just want this to be an idea I'm not interested in you just having the right theological affirmation. I want there to be a practical outworking, an experiential reality where you know one another and you are known by one another and you encourage one another in real practical ways. And so as we close our time together this morning, as we close our time together in the book of Ephesians, I want to ask you to, to pray for one another and seek to encourage one another. Seek to bless one another with the, the spirit and the content of Paul's final words here. May you say in your prayers and in your conversations with one another, may we say, may peace be to all of us. May the gospel of peace transform us. May the love of God rest upon us as we believe in the gospel. May the grace of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all as we love the Lord Jesus Christ with the, the very incorruptible love that he has loved us with. And more and more, in ever-increasing ways, may this peace, this love, this faith, this grace that we experience in the gospel, may it cause us in very practical ways to pursue one another towards the end of real gospel fellowship. May we reach out to one another more and more. May we share with one another and listen to one another and encourage one another May we say, Hi, is it? just a moment, I, I want you to know how I'm doing, and I'd like to know how you're doing. May we pick up the phone, invite people over, linger a little bit more in the hallways. May we share with one another, listen to one another, encourage one another, and may God's peace and love and grace overcome our proclivities to self-absorption and excessive busyness. 
and misplaced priorities and very real differences. May it overcome our fears and our anger and our hurts and our mistrust. Well, by the power of the gospel working in us and through us, may we be the church. May we not just like the idea of the church, but by God's grace, may we really and truly be the church for one another. May it be so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you help us to receive the experiential power of the gospel? To not just theologically affirm your peace and your grace and your love, but to really know it and be changed by it so that we turn towards one another and we pursue one another in order that we might be at peace with one another and love one another and be gracious to one another. Oh, that we might know and be known and in so doing, be a great source of encouragement to one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.